Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Simply Investing. Another morning chat. Well, kind of a morning chat. I want to really talk about Bank of America and Tesla. Bank of America, I kept rocking it since the last couple of years. You know, I, I just could not see how that how bank of that size was valued that low. And lo and behold again, this morning, beat expectations by 17%. So, the earnings, I think, ended at 41 cents a share, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Considering all that's going on in the banking world, pretty good. I think they're going to do well going forward. I think, barring that, you know, we don't find out that they have some sort of major scandal going on. Who, who, who knows nowadays, you know. But, <clears throat> I think it will work. <clears throat> I think it'll work out well for the next couple years. I mean, my only expectation is if the earnings keeps rising and beating expectations, the dividend better start rising. That's my only expectations with it. Um, but I don't see it really like skyrocketing. But in two years, maybe close to like twenty-eight dollars a share. In a couple years, I can see that happening. But who knows with the Trump administration how that's going to end up panning out. Um, it's kind of hard to say. I think everyone's just not sure where to go. But certainly bank stocks have taken a nice bump up. But we'll have to see because the even though most banks don't deal with subprime lending, but car loans are going downhill. And subprime lenders are stopping subprime lending because they're default. They're having too many defaults. Now, from my experience, this is just has all the same markers of the 2008 crisis in the car industry bubble. Like it's a bubble, and it's just about ready to pop. So, if you're actually looking for a new car, maybe in a couple years, you might get one up for a good deal because car dealers need to pump out some volume like always to pay off that debt but that was just due to irresponsibility in the car loan industry I mean I've seen some people get like I would not lend someone whose credit score is under 500 30 grand to buy a brand new Impala that, that you know is going to be worth 18 in, in a year like you're already upside down on so much negative interest and just the and the person's not paying down the principal. They're most likely not. And they're missing payments. So it's a little difficult at that range. Um, another good but speaking of cars, Tesla. I, I'm still gonna say this about the electric car industry is if someone can make a good solid electric car that can go 500 miles on one charge that doesn't have all the bells and whistles but kind of gets you to from point A to point B kind of like a Corolla but priced in between 15 and 20,000 I'm telling you something someone's gonna make a lot of money in that market because even still people are like well gas prices are low but yeah but if you don't have to it's $15 a month to charge the car as opposed to Fifty dollars a week to fill your tank, like that. Like, of course, I, anyone would take that. Even if you had an SUV, I'd be like, "Well, shit, I'm getting an electric car," just because that's going to save you about two hundred dollars over the course of the lifetime of the car. You're going to save a hell of a lot more than you would with a traditional combustion car. But this is just where it's like, as Americans, we're stupid. As soon as gas prices drop 10 cents, we're all back buying trucks and big ass cars. That's a bad idea. I don't know, gas prices didn't get down to 90 cents when I, when I was back to like when I was started driving. So I couldn't see driving a big, big truck. I mean, I drive Mercedes, but, and even still, it's like 50 bucks every every week and a half, two weeks, the way I drive, that's a lot of money. And if you cut that out, well, that's 1200 bucks a year. And if you're trying to scrimp and save and balance your budget, 
electric car might do it for you. Now where Tesla comes in is that I think they fit like they're in the luxury electric car brand. And I think that's where they are. I like I like their S their flagship model. I I like their new one. I like the fact that they're trying to make a thirty-five thousand dollar one. But my thing is that you can get along without all the gadgets and whistles. Like you don't have to. How should I put this? You don't have to. Um, but you don't have to have a car that has a 10 inch touchscreen. You don't have to have a car that self drives itself right now. Like until self driving can be implemented in all cars as a standard feature, it's it's kind of a useless feature right now. So I don't need to spend an extra twelve thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars to get a car that self drives. What I need to do is get a car that that is down that fits the income levels and fits the the loaning levels. But with that said though, I still think the thirty five thousand will still fit in a lot of Americans' budgets. I think they just need to make just make a practical car. Just make a practical car and we'll be set. Other than that, I I can ignore all the critics on Tesla because I can I can kind of buy into his linear ideal for the growth. Like, and I understand that even though this company is what, maybe seven years old, ten was it seven eight years old, it's still got a long ways to go before it hits that threshold, and they've come a long way. I would say maybe in two, three years, they're probably going to be able to produce two lines of cars at the same time, and I think, I think the people will start allowing them to have more dealerships, which allow them to sell more cars, because what a lot of people don't understand is like Tesla, the critics say, well, Tesla doesn't sell a lot of cars, well, that's because of the of the mainstay automakers and the blue book laws are forcing you know it's like some a lot of states still you can't buy a tesla directly like you literally have to have someone go to a state buy it and then bring it back and then transfer the title then sell it to you as a used car and that's the only way to get a tesla in your in your um in some states that that basically ban tesla from being sold it's like well, if I ban a deal you from selling being able to sell in a dealership, you know, as a car as a car manufacturer, I pretty much banned you from from selling. Like it's almost like you're creating a monopoly, which I think if we're truly in a capitalist society, shouldn't have any bylaws regarding that. You survive, you survive. If you don't, you don't. You should have done better. Like that that's just my my personality. As as a business, it's completely Darwinism. Just you make it, you make it. If you fail, it's your own damn fault. No one else is your fault. Don't blame anyone else. It's your fault. But back to Tesla. It, I can see it going a little higher. I, I, I can see it going wide, like in 10 years, being a wildly successful company. And I don't... And I know people are trying to bash it, and this is where I said there's negative press about it, and it's paid negative press, because why would you call a car company a Ponzi scheme? You pay for a freaking vehicle. Like, you're getting what you pay for. How is that a fucking Ponzi scheme? Tell me now how that's a Ponzi scheme. I give you money, I get a vehicle. That's not a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is I give you money, I don't get anything, you just keep telling me I'm going to keep blowing smoke up my ass saying I'm going to get this much return when it's not a return. He never guarantees any returns. He guarantees steady linear growth for 100 years is what he's basically said. That's not a Ponzi scheme. He said steady linear growth that we will push forward as long as you follow this, this, and this will be fine. He is a very intelligent man and he knows decent enough about marketing and he knows a lot about his product which is why he's going to succeed. So even still, with the $300 price tag, it still could be a good buy, but I wouldn't buy it unless if you have a substantial portfolio already. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't start investing in it. I would say, I'd say if you, if you, if you're over the fifty thousand mark, you probably could start investing in it, but in small doses, but not enough to really grasp that the growth that you'll get from it. I'd say you probably want to make sure your portfolio is over two hundred fifty thousand to really put a decent chunk in there and be able to grab a, enough of the equity growth that will happen. But those are my two companies I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I do say that right now I'm up 19% on my portfolio for the month. Kind of went down a little bit. That's all right. I think I think my pay, my um, heavy investment in PPL is going to pay off more so on the dividend side than on the on the price tag side, but you know, I think it will go over forty dollars a share. It's at like just under thirty-eight right now. I think it'll go over forty. As long as I keep paying dividends, that's my balance for stock. I will say this though, I'm switching a lot of my stocks to steady blue chip stocks. You know, I got I had Microsoft since it was twenty-four dollars a share. It's now sixty-five dollars a share. It might be time to dump that stock. I don't know yet. I still feel like it's a hold to me. Apple's still a hold to me. Got, I said that's probably my riskiest venture because I got 30% of my portfolio in Apple. But, you know, I've got Apple. I haven't bought any shares since May of, I think, 2012. And I bought them at technically $71 a share. So, you know, I made $70 per share, and I can't argue that, but I think Apple's just going to keep growing and steadily grow. I mean, they're, people always worry about their phones, but they don't sell phones. They sell a lifestyle, and that's, I still don't think people who try to invest in Apple or analyze Apple don't understand you're not buying an iPhone you're not buying an iPad you're buying a lifestyle you're because if you have an I, iPhone odds are you have at least an Apple watch and a MacBook or an iMac and maybe an Apple TV I can almost guarantee you, I almost guarantee you have an Apple TV because you have iTunes you probably have movies in the cloud so you probably have an Apple TV. So, so that I still th I still think Apple's a hold. I I would be wary about buying it if you don't have Apple. Uh, I wouldn't buy more than five percent of your portfolio into Apple. This wouldn't be something I would put a lot of a lot of money into right now. Now, if it goes down, I would start I would chip. I start sucking up a little bit more, but if it just keeps rising, then I'll just leave it alone. I still hold on to Wells Fargo and Bank of America. They're still holds for me. I mean, Bank of America is going to be a hold for a long time. If anything, I should buy more of Bank of America. The only other stock that I've, I've added to my my regular base ten is Walmart. I've added Walmart into my base 10. Just because this is me preparing for the economy slowdown and Walmart's a good place to park money because Walmart will always be around. People always say Amazon, but if the economy's slowing and you cut your internet bill, how are you gonna buy from Amazon? You know, people still need to go to brick and mortar stores. Like I said, when I, when I run out of toilet paper, I don't need to order it off of Amazon and wait two days or a day. Even if they have an hour shipping, when in 10 minutes, I can run down to the grocery store, buy it, and run back home. That's just my philosophy, because necessities, and Walmart's good at selling necessities, like toilet paper, cleaners, toothpaste, deodorant, all the, the necessities of life. 
and that's their base. That's their bread and butter. Everything else is extra, but that's their bread and butter. Like the necessities, like air filters. Like you going to go to Walmart to buy yourself a five dollar air filter or thirteen, or whatever it is. Um, the only other stock I might drop from my my mainstay ten is BB and T Bank. I think. I don't think there's any more value I can get out of there. And I just have this bad gut feeling about it. So I've had it since it was $38 a share. It's now $49. I know that they've been expanding into car loans, but they do a lot of it is subprime lending that they call, that they do their car loans in. And they're going to get hit hard from it. So I think I'm going to dump them. Take my money and move on. Like, I made quite a bit of money off of them. They paid a lot of dividends. Not great dividends, but steady dividends. So, I think I should, I'm going to drop them and let them ride. Um, only thing I might pick up, I might watch, is Citizens Bank. I'm going to wait to see how that lawsuit's going to handle on them for it to drop. And then that might replace my thing. Or might sample 10 or I might just go with a mainstay nine nine stocks as my main and start use the money from that to invest in JetBlue. I think JetBlue is going to be good but I'm still watching it. I haven't yet invested I'm just still watching it. Still looks like it could be a breakaway stock for me. And I think I think if we have a good year and you know Trump brings back manufacturing to America like he says he's trying to do going to do I think we have a fair chance at seeing the average household income rise substantially which will then allow for per for purchases to rise which I don't think it will be like consumables I just think people will start to travel more millennials like to travel I think they'll travel and as long as JetBlue's expanding, I think they'll be fine. With that said, that's all I got. A little bit longer than my normal video. Um, love to hear your guys' comments and suggestions in below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I will try to keep you guys updated more on my portfolio progress. I will not be doing the Robin Hood app experiment anymore. I think that kind of ran its course. If you, I think it's a good app for people to get started in, but... As far as actual trading, you need to get a more professional trader like Interactive Broker if you really want to get to that level. Because I don't care how much I pay for a trade because my trades will generally mount well more than whatever the commission is. You just got to factor it into your win-loss to your win -loss strategy. Well, with that said, good luck, good hunting. Respect the process. Remember, do your diligence. Do the research. Don't invest in anything you don't understand. With that, I'll see you next video. Comment. Message me if you have any questions. I'm always there to help and try to do my best for everybody. Thanks, and have a wonderful day.